everybody and welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping Educational Program. Today I have my friend and co-partner and partner in education and crime, whatever all, Dr. Uh, William Lester from the University of Florida IFAS here in Hernando County, the Extension Office. He's the urban horticulture agent and he um, graciously decided to join me this morning so he can um, throw in a little bit of his knowledge but also he's going to throw in a portion on spring vegetable gardening as well as the pretty flowers. So let's get started with spring into Florida friendly landscaping and Bill I'll probably be you know um, soliciting your opinion on some of these slides from time to time. Okay, no problem I'm here. Okay. Here, um, I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities um, in the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator. I work here for the Water Department under Water Conservation. If you'd like a copy of this uh, PowerPoint in a PDF form emailed to you, email me and um, ask me for it. Or if you have any other questions that you wanted to follow up on, there's two ways to email me now. Either way, we'll get um, to me. I have two email addresses now. The, the old one will work just fine, Lily B, L-I-L-L-Y-B at HernandoCounty.us. But now we have a new one um, that is kind of more generic, but I'm the one who sees it. So we send it to either one, Hernando County F fl at hernandocounty.us. Either one of those will work just fine. And if you have a question specific to Dr. Lester, make sure it's really hard. Send those emails to Dr. Lester at wlester at ufl.edu. Here are the nine principles of uh, Florida Friendly Landscaping. We're probably going to cover quite a bit of them today. Um, everything I teach and really everything Dr. Lester teaches um, beckons back to one or more of these nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. So first, well, you know, let's just let's try to get this one cleared up here in Florida. When Dr. Lester, when, do you, when when is winter over? When is it going to be over here in Florida? It feels awfully nice the past few days. Are we done with winter? No, we're not. And it's really hard to say exactly when it ends and the chances of a freeze or frost drop to zero. Generally, March 15th-ish. Yes, ish. We could always yeah. say March 15th, the years past past several years we've had freezes the first week in April. So it is difficult. I know it's difficult for me to be out there when the weather is gorgeous and not clean this stuff up. You know, like this, these fried banana trees here. Um, it is really hard not to do it. But we have reasons um, that we would, it is highly suggested for the health of your plants, that you wait until after the danger of frost or freeze is over to do a lot of this cleanup, this spring cleanup. Several reasons for it. Even though this old dead fried frozen material is not attractive to you, it is providing a layer of protection because in these warm spurts that we have, and we're gonna be getting rain, getting rain today, probably getting rain through the weekend, It'll warm up a little bit. New growth is going to want to come by itself. And then, boom, we could have another freeze. So that new growth is especially susceptible to freezes and frosts. And it is more likely to take the damage to the core of the plant, causing more damage than before. So this old, ugly stuff does act as a layer of protection. Also, if you prune it all off, pruning encourages new growth. That's just what it does. And we just explained to you how um, susceptible to freezer frost damage tender new growth can be. 
another reason to want to keep some of the what we call you know we think it's unattractive but you go out in the woods no one's cleaning that all up you know it's just frozen until the new growth comes but um, especially our native bees might be making homes in some of the dead looking stems that we have so just as I say live with the ugly if you can I know it's really hard know you're taking chances if you prune it earlier that you could um, you know lose the whole the whole plant that way that being said deciduous plants hard um, hard woody plants that don't have any uh, growth in the winter now is a good time to prune those isn't that correct Dr. Lester Yes, as a general rule, you want to trim them middle of February. Okay, yes. And if they are spring bloomers, like right now, um, I have seen azaleas blooming already. Seems to me that the things, the blooming time, the blooming schedule has been moved up a good two weeks from when I was growing up here in Florida. <laughs> you know, it's it's happening a little sooner than it used to. Um, your azaleas are gonna bloom for a while, I'd say through mid-March. When they are done blooming or your camellias will be done before that, um, you can prune them then or no later than June 30th. If you feel you have to prune, you know, your azalea bushes, your camellias, things such as that. If you prune them after June 30th, then you won't have a beautiful, lovely spring <laughs> the next spring. So. Just know those things too. All right, this is happening. This is happening out there, isn't it, Dr. Lester? And yes, there, there's a few in the neighborhood that I drive through that's right next to our neighborhood. And yeah, they, every year, and I mean, they'll prune them several times a year. They just are obsessed yeah. with having them look like this. These are crepe myrtles for those who might not know, might not be following. And if you're new here, and you, you're seeing this done all over the place. I, I took this picture, I called it a row of moaning myrtles um, in a parking lot here in Hernando County. Um, it's done, it's done all over the place. So then you see it being done and people think I've got to really prune back my crepe myrtle. So I have written here, the proper things that you should do, but can you tell us, Dr. Lester, why the University of Florida advises against this severe pruning or hat racking? Because they look like hat racks, don't they? Um, yeah. Wh why? Why shouldn't we do it? It's not best for the health of the plant. And they found that you can just let them go and never prune them. But you're going to get the best results and the most flowers if you prune them lightly. And like you have on the slide here, uh, trim out the old flower stalks from the previous year, the little twiggy branches, crossing branches, suckers that come from this trunk down low. You can remove all of them just fine. But other than that, you should really match up your variety of crepe myrtle with how much room you're giving it to grow in. Correct. Right. So the older ones, uh, the white ones, everything in their DNA wants them to be, what, 30 feet tall? You know? Oh, they'll, they, yeah, they'll, they'll get as tall as your house. I know somebody yeah. in my neighborhood that has one. It's a beautiful front yard tree. Flowers just great every summer, white flowers on it. Mm -hmm. Looks very, very nice. Never, ever prune, and it's full mature site, and they are yeah. big. Um, my son lives in Hampton, Virginia which that's basically their street trees are crepe myrtles. It's another issue. I have an issue with that because there are so many of them. If they get a crepe myrtle disease, they're going to lose <laughs> all their trees. <laughs> so that, you know, there's not much diversity there. Also, crepe myrtles are great, but they're the, not the best wildlife attractors. You could do better, you know, with, with native plants. That being said, in that area, they don't touch them and they are very, very tall and start to have a weeping form and look very attractive. So 
as Bill said, you don't have to prune it at all. Bill's um, boss, his director of Hernando County Extension, Jim Davis, he did an experiment that he told me about. He had three great myrtles in his yard. So one year he decided to do an experiment. He did not do anything to one of them, didn't prune it at all. The next one, he did this light pruning, which like I said, you remove crossing branches. You can cut off those black old um, flower stalks from last year. You don't have to, but you can. Anything all inside that is, you know, pencil sized or less, you know, you can get rid of all that, air it out, clean it up. Suckers on the bottom, crepe myrtles love to have those suckers on the bottom, clean that out. He did that. And then the next one, he did this, you know, this severe pruning to, you know, where the uh, crepe myrtle, if you do that year after year, it ends up getting those fist looking scars where I always say they're angry. Like, why? Why'd you do this, Jimmy? So <laughs> he did that to his three. The one that bloomed the most for him was that middle one that had that light pruning done. Will you kill your crepe myrtles by this severe pruning? No, you may shorten the lifespan of it. Mm -hmm. um, pruning it back like this, you're pretty much going to have to continue doing it year after year. Uh, it does make it look like kind of a bonsai kind of look, I guess. Mm -hmm. Or we mentioned in Europe, they do this pollard, 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 I can never say the word. Pollarding. Pollarding. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what they're trying to emulate here, but it doesn't quite work out the same. If you, these can have beautiful winter form if you leave them alone and let them grow as they were meant to grow. Beautiful bark, beautiful form as years pass. If you keep doing this, and you know, if it's done in a commercial situation like this or in um, the common grounds in different communities, sure, the, the crews that go through there have to get a lot done, they have to do it quickly. So they, that's just what they do. But do they care that they're replacing these trees every eight to 10 years? No, no, <laughs> you know, so you might in your own yard, you would rather have that yard, that tree for 20 plus years. So you have, the opportunity and the time to prune it correctly. Let's move on from there and talk about mulch. I'm gonna have a class on mulch on uh, next week, an in-person class at the library. So you can hear everything you always wanted to know about mulch in that class. But you can't, we were telling you, don't go crazy pruning your crepe myrtles. Don't go pruning all that old dead stuff away. What can you do out there in your yard? great time to refresh your mulch. It improves the soil, eases your maintenance up a bit, adds, um, helps improve the plant performance, adds beauty to the landscape. Suppresses weeds is kind of a, uh, I'm always kind of hesitant saying that because I have seen gorgeous weeds on mulch. <laughs> so it all just depends on how much maintenance you know you're able to keep up because weed seeds will fall on top of the mulch and obviously grow on the mulch. I think mulch is just like making your own bed in your bedroom at home. The room doesn't look clean until the bed is made. So mulch kind of does the same thing for your yard. It really helps define those um, flower beds, gives you a neat look. Also, it's going to, uh, over time, help improve our sandy soil. It's going to break down and it's going to add to the moisture holding and nutrient holding ability of the soil. But you, you, can, you can mess up mulching. <laughs> it is possible to mess up mulching. And what are the ways in which you can not do it right, Dr. Lester? If you put down too thick of a layer of mulch. If you put down four, five, six, eight inches of mulch, what happens is it holds the moisture in too well. And now, especially during the summer when we get a lot of rain, 
you just turn like the picture here, this flower bed into basically a mud bed. And we'll see a number of landscape plants and bushes die from root rot problems in the summer. And one of the causes of that, along with overwatering on top of the rainfall is too much mulch. And the mulch will get compacted and now the soil can't breathe and it becomes, it just stays too wet for too long. Yes. And also people, that's another thing you'll see. Um, I don't have it on here because it, it'll be discussed in the mulch class, but what we call volcano mulching. And you all know what I'm talking about. As soon as I said the word, you can visualize it and you see it around where people really pile it up around trees. That is not recommended at all. That you might as well have buried that tree that far into the ground, um, which is not good for it. They, the roots of your trees need oxygen. They need um, you know, to be able to breathe. There's at the bottom of your tree has a flare. That flare needs to be out and unexposed. Another thing um, that that amount of mulch up around your tree can do is mat up to create like an umbrella effect so that the water isn't even reaching the tree when it rains there. So again, that two to three inches of mulch around your tree, not touching the base of your tree, and the same goes for the plants in your flower beds too. All right, fertilizing, that is more your area of expertise. So I'll let you talk about fertilizing in general. Sure, as a general rule, you really have to look at what plant you're talking about to decide whether you should fertilize it or not. A lot of plants in your landscape don't really need any fertilizer. Uh, things like landscape trees, a lot of the uh, hedge bushes, uh, hollies and viburnums, podocarpus, things like that really don't need to be fertilized. Other plants do need to be fertilized. A couple of uh, really important examples are palm trees. Mm -hmm. They need to be fertilized with a quality palm fertilizer. That means not the cheapest stuff, not necessarily the most expensive, but a good brand of palm fertilizer. If you have any kind of fruit trees or citrus trees, they're going to need to be fertilized. You need to fertilize your citrus with a good citrus fertilizer because it has all the micronutrients in it the citrus trees need. Vegetable gardens, flower beds. So if you're growing annual flowers, they're probably going to need a light fertilizing. But many times people end up putting down too much fertilizer as opposed to they send the email us pictures. We look at it. I don't think I've ever told somebody to go home and fertilize because if they have a problem, the solution is pr almost never put down more fertilizer. Okay. And if you have a service, don't worry. Those guys are not shy with putting down fertilizer. They put down more than enough. So you may want to, before you decide, um, we have a tendency to, if we see a plant struggling, the first thing we want to do is give it more water, which may not be what it needs. The second thing we want to do is try and fertilize it may not be what it needs. So we do suggest you get a soil analysis. Um, you can tell us how to get a soil sample, um, get your soil tested here in Hernando County. How do you go about doing that? Sure, just contact our office and we could email you, or if you stop by our office, we can give you the form that you need to fill out, a little fact sheet on how to take a sample. You're just taking about a cup's worth of soil and mailing it to the uh, University of Florida Soil Testing Lab up in Gainesville. And they check it for pH and the levels of phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and a few other um, micronutrients. And it's a really good idea just to make sure that your soil isn't unusual. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes people will want to put in a Bahia lawn. Bahia lawns need a pH of about 5.5. If you live right along the coast and your pH is unusually high or something that we see a lot is with new home construction, they'll bring in fill dirt and they get it from wherever. And right. we've seen some really, really unusual numbers when they analyze fill dirt that was put in somebody's front yard for their lawn. So it's always a good idea, maybe once a year to have your soil tested just to make sure 
you don't have any unusual numbers that are going to preclude you from growing something. Or maybe you'll find out that your soil is very acidic and you can grow blueberries and they're going to do just great. So it's a really good starting spot. And it, what is it now? $10 um, per sample? Yeah, it's $10 a sample. Okay. Okay. And for a normal homeowner lawn, you only have to send off one sample. Right. And speaking of lawns, Hernando County is under a fertilizer ordinance at this time. Um, and we are speaking on February 3rd, 2023. This is how the ordinance is today. I've heard some little birdies tweeting that this um, may be being um, looked at to be changed. When it is changed, I promise you it's not gonna get less strict. <laughs> so, you know, look for uh, the dates stretching and things possibly like right now, um, at no time of the year, um, do they want you to fertilize within 10 feet of an actual waterway. I bet you that'll be stretching because um, in Citrus County right now, it's 25 feet. So, as of today, homeowners are um, restricted from fertilizing their lawns. I'm not referring to vegetable gardens here. I'm not referring to the palm trees or the citrus trees. We're talking about lawn fertilizer um, from January 1st to March 31st. Is that, will that hurt your lawn not to fertilize it during that time frame, Dr. Lester? No, because that's during the winter dormant period where your lawn right now is dormant. You're not cutting it as often. It's not as green. It's not growing. So it doesn't need the fertilizer. And if you do fertilize it, it's not going to take it up anyway. You're just wasting your time and money. Right. So this is not a terrible <laughs> thing. Now, professionals are allowed to fertilize during this time frame. Um, if they use a slow release uh, fertilizer. And the reason we gave them this leeway is because, you know, the University of Florida, if you look on their publications, they'll tell you, you should start fertilizing your lawn around March 15th. Waiting till April 1st won't hurt your lawn at all. Waiting till June won't hurt your lawn at all. But they figured these companies they have a lot of people that they want to service. So let's give them that extra time to start around mid-March so they can get all of their customers done. What would you do if you had a lawn company, Dr. Lester, who was out there in January and now fertilizing your lawn? I would seriously question why they're doing it. And then I question the competence of the company, honestly, because fertilizer that time of year is not going to improve the look of your lawn. What is going to improve the look of your lawn is spring coming and the rains, longer days, warmer weather, and your grass starting to grow. There you go. Okay, yeah, you've got this. You know, irrigation system and we're still in the time frame as he just mentioned your lawn's semi-dormant yes we're in central florida but we do have a winter season the plants know it that lawn as he he insinuated there that lawn responds mainly to the amount of daylight hours doesn't care that it got up to 86 degrees you know it's daylight hours that it's responding to in its growth patterns because we have warm season grasses. Up north, you may have had a cool season grass, which would tell you why it was green under the snow and brown during a drought in August. So we have warm season grasses that are golden colored in the winter. Nothing wrong with a straw colored, we're changing the, the narrative to golden colored lawns in the winter. You can skip a week of irrigation if you even need to irrigate at all, but it's a great time to get out there and evaluate your irrigation system. And I'll let Dr. Lester take the lead in telling you all the things you should be doing with that. 
with um, your irrigation system, it's always very important to go out there during the day because a lot of people have a set to run at night or you're, you're not out there watching it run necessarily. But go out there and test run it, go through zone by zone, double check the sprinkler heads, make sure they're not broken like the one pictured here and you have a volcano of water shooting up and you're just wasting water. Make sure your sprinkler heads are all spraying where you want them to spray. They're not watering your car or house or street. They're watering the grass. Um, if a sprinkler head is not coming on and no water is coming out, there may be a broken pipe underground. So these are all things that you want to look at because if they're going on, you're wasting huge amounts of water and your lawn is not getting all the water where it needs it, when it needs it. So a lot of people are very handy. You could do it yourself. You can repair these heads on your own. Others will probably want to contact an irrigation contractor. And especially if you have a lawn service to cut your lawn for you, keep in mind a lot of times they'll use very large equipment, large riding mowers, and they're very heavy. And they put a beating on people's irrigation systems. I know I live in a neighborhood and had a gentleman cut the lawn. I had to go out there and check my system maybe once a month because there was always a broken or misaligned head. So big lawnmowers put a big beating on little tiny plastic sprinkler heads. So you may have to go out there once a month and check it, but it's very important because that's a really good way to save water or waste huge amounts of water. I know Lily and I have gone out and looked at people's yards because they were getting very, very large water bills from Hernando County Utilities. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the timer being off or broken sprinkler heads or something else out of order was the root cause of why they were getting such a huge water bill. Yes. And, um, you know, you don't see these slides until you're presenting that I didn't see that I had last year's uh, daylight savings time on here. So whatever day daylight savings time starts <laughs> this year, make sure that um, when you, you you change your clocks back, you check your smoke alarm and then go out in the garage and make sure you check your irrigation clock um, for your irrigation. It will be very, very important right now um, because we we did speak to someone who got caught with that and they got fined, didn't they, Dr. Lester? Because they're they they were set for the wrong time that we were in and they were watering when they shouldn't have been. And we do have I'm telling everybody spread the word, please go out there, shout this in the streets. We have <laughs> Hernando County has two new code enforcement officers who officers whose whole job is to monitor watering restrictions. That's their whole job. And they work split shifts and they work um, at night, late. <laughs> they work in the, on the weekends and they do have access to all gated communities. I, we did hear from someone um, with a complaint that they've been watering this way which was not, uh, you know, according to our watering restrictions uh, for 16 years. And now she has a hundred dollar fine with no warnings. That's how code enforcement operates. You will get a fine if you are caught violating. So pass that word. And I can also warn you, it's not gonna stay at hundred dollars. It's not one of those pay to spray situations where you think I'll just pay the hundred dollars. No, it goes up quickly and you end up before a special magistrate. So, you know, we're, we're, we're getting serious about people uh, being good stewards of our water. So the lawn basics in the spring, uh, fertilize after March 31st, that date might be extended. They might be working on extending those dates. What do you feel about if you had to wait till June to fertilize your lawn, Dr. Lester? No, it wouldn't be. People, when we see people who have lawn problems, it's never a situation where they're not fertilizing enough. Right. So I, I wouldn't think that lack of fertilizer is going to be the big deciding point or breaking point, whether you have a beautiful green lawn, like the picture here, 
or a completely dead log. Right. And when I'm saying June, I'm thinking that is probably not correct because the dates they'll want to incorporate in the ban are, are heavy rain dates. So, you know, we will have probably six months, I'm not sure which six months, <laughs> that you are allowed to fertilize. But as you said, it's not a life or death situation for your lawn, whether it's fertilized or not. We have seen lawns die because they were fertilized. We've never seen one die because it wasn't. Exactly. Yes. University of Florida does not encourage or recommend weed and feed products. Some people's minds get blown by that. Why is that, Dr. Lester? Because they're not designed to be used here in Central Florida. Here, we take care of weed problems at a different time of year than when you're putting down fertilizer. And that's a combination of weed killer and fertilizer together. So we're doing ours at different times of the year. Right. And you should probably, if you are concerned about spring weeds in your lawn, you should, that is something you can do now, correct? Put down a pre-emergent. Yes. Right now, so anytime between right now and the middle of February is when you want to put down a pre-emergent. If you're going to use one to stop weeds coming up in the spring that are normally going to grow all summer and be a huge problem at the end of summer. So things like sand spurs, they get stuck in your feet in August, but you have to go back and deal with them in February to solve the problem. Nothing you can do about them in August. Okay. It's too late now. And how important is this mowing at three and a half, it should say three and a half <laughs> to four inches um, in the overall health of a lawn? Probably the most important thing that you could do for a healthy lawn. St. Augustine ideally needs to be cut at four inches high. Even Bahia should be cut at three inches or higher. The higher you cut your grass, the healthier it's going to be. And the better it's going to hold water because it's shading out the surface a little bit, the better it's going to resist having a bad weed problem. So it helps with solving a lot of other side problems too. It really is. If it, it's good news because it's so simple, but yet it's like the main thing people don't want to follow. Mm -hmm. And you would just have a much healthier stand of lawn. St. Augustine or Floritam lawn was uh, developed to grow at three and a half to four inches. Um, Dr. Lester and I stumbled upon some native St. Augustine, not Floritam, native St. Augustine grass at the edge of the Gulf, growing in very deep shade. But how tall was it? About a foot. Well, and a it was six inches tall or taller. Six, well, eight yeah, it was, it was yeah, eight, eight to 12 inches. It was very, very healthy, too. <laughs> very healthy, very green. And that thing got salt water all over, you know, that patch. Yeah. But it didn't grow, it didn't look like this in this picture. It looked like bunch grasses. So once upon a time, somebody took this native St. Augustine grass and thought, hmm, how do I turn this into a meadow? <laughs> you know, which it was never meant to be. And, you know, they worked with engineering and designing it, came up with many different varieties. What we've settled on now for a long time is this Floritam variety. But it still is not made to be two and a half. You know, it's not supposed to look like a putting green at a golf course, or it's just not going to be happy. It's been hybridized to the point where it is nothing resembling a native plant at all. Um, so, but if you just let it grow to the length that it, you know, you put that lawnmower blade as high as it can possibly go. Now you did this when you had a lawn company, he told you he was mowing that high and you went out and measured, correct? Yeah. Um... As a general rule for most people, just go ahead and set your lawnmower on the highest setting. Now, a lot of lawnmowers, because all the models and manufacturers are all different, some of them even at the highest setting is not very high, but you should definitely go out there and measure it. 
And then what we tell homeowners to do, if they say, well, yeah, he told me he cut it four inches high. After you have your long cut, go out there with a the ruler and measure it. The tops of the blades should be three and a half to four inches above ground level. And the water that it needs is one and a half, or I'm sorry, half an inch <laughs> to three quarters of an inch per watering event. That will take a while to explain. Um, you can email Dr. Lester or I for more of an explanation, or you can go to Hernando County Government YouTube. We have lots of classes explaining about irrigation. And I think we have one coming up as well. So it's spring it's and you wanna think about bringing in new plants. So what you need to do first is check your available space. <laughs> but you know, that is, you know, um, failing to plan is planting to fail. <laughs> so check your available space, check your soil and light conditions. Don't just go out and buy something because it's pretty, you know, figure out, sketch it out, make a rough, a rough draft of where you draw in your house and your existing plants, but also talk about this area is sunny, this area is shady, this area gets morning sun, this area holds moisture, this is very dry. And think about where you want to put your plants. But also, you know you, and don't be um, swayed by an impulse buy by a pretty plant. Decide how much maintenance it is, you know, that you would like to do and be realistic about that, you know, for the success of the plant. Um, as I said, plan before you buy and plan, failure to plan is planting to fail. It starts with healthy plants. It starts at the nursery. Um, so would you like to go over what you should do here at the nursery, Dr. Lester? when you're looking for plants? Sure, well, first of all, you only want to deal with, you know, reputable professional nurseries, but you need to look the plant over carefully, look for any uh, insect problems, scales, aphids, uh, dying plants, dying leaves, damaged leaves, holes in leaves, distorted new growth. These are all signs and symptoms of some kind of either insect pest or disease. Reputable nurseries do a very good job of making sure that they only offer quality plants, quality healthy plants for sale. And state of Florida does inspect them, but you wanna be, you wanna double check and be diligent that you're only buying healthy plants. I know what a lot of people do is when they bring new plants home, they kind of put them off to the side, kind of put them in um, a little, emergency room basically to mm -hmm. give them a couple of days or a week or so to make sure that there's no problems with them. And I know people love buying plants off the clearance cart. Hey, I try to save money also. And a lot of times they're marked down 50% off, 90% off, 99% off, whatever. Mm -hmm. Those plants a lot of times died from something. If it was a lack of water, you may be able to water it and bring it back to life. If it was an insect problem or a disease, if you buy it and bring it home and put it in your landscape, you just potentially brought something bad home and introduced it to your other plants. Right. So you always want to keep that in mind. We advise people to kind of avoid the, the clearance cart plants. We'll leave that up to you. It's just, you know. Right. And everyone has a story. Figure out what, what killed it, basically. They, everyone has a story of how they nurtured one back to health, but, mm -hmm. you know, consider, as you just mentioned, the rest of your landscape. Um, we will address uh, questions in the chat at the end of the class, and um, we'll turn off the recording and we'll chat with the live uh, people here, um, answer their questions on the chat. When you go to plant these plants that you have picked up and you put them in their little debriefing area that Dr. Lester mentioned, you know, first, and, you know, decide where you want to plant them. You kind of already got an idea when you made that landscape evaluation. Um, remember, the first principle of Florida friendly landscaping is right plant, right place. We've added an extra one, uh, right plant, right place, and right care. Remember, um, when, the, when these plants are um, 
in the nursery. They're get, they get watered all the time. So they're used to a lot of water, plus every plant, whether or not it is a native plant or a drought tolerant plant, a Florida friendly plant, every plant needs a good amount of water to get established. So don't just plant it and forget it. It's going to need some attention and some water and um, kind of wean them off from that amount of water that they're used to getting at the nursery, you know, over time. And consider the mature size. We kind of went over that with crepe myrtles, but think about how big they're gonna get or how much they're gonna spread. And when you plant them, don't just cover them with mulch right away, um, especially newer mulch, um, fresh mulch out of the bag. But you, if you have it, just make sure you pull it away from that new plant so that new plant can get the water and the mulch doesn't rob the plant of the water. So that's that fine line you have to walk with that mulch. But when you are planting them, this goes for trees to daisies. <laughs> um, I, there's a diagram here and uh, Jim Mull from Pasco County, uh, the master gardener coordinator there, he's had a saying for a long time, plant them high and they won't die, plant them low and they won't grow. You want that root ball from your original, you know, when you pull it out of the pot, you want that above, you want to see it, you want it to be above the um, soil line. You might feel like it's a little too high. You might look at it and like, eh, it's a little too high. That's better than putting it in too low. There's only really one plant out there that you can stick deep in the ground and cover up the stem. And what is that, Dr. Lester? Tomatoes. Tomatoes, that's right. <laughs> None of these are, uh, for everything else, you can put the mulch, but don't put it over that root ball and have the top of the root ball 10% above the landscape soil. You're gonna feel like that's kind of weird, but we guarantee you that is a better situation for your plant. Now I'm gonna quickly go over some pretty flowers that you can grow here in this spring and into summer um, here in Hernando County. And then I'll let Dr. Lester take over the veggie portion because I know both are exciting to you. If you go up in North Florida um, around April, probably March, April, their roadsides are covered in these yellow black eye Susans. Um, gorgeous out there and they can go great, grow great in your wildflower garden or your more formal garden as well from March through July, really, sometimes even longer. Um, pot marigolds. They do well um, starting in March and they'll do well for about three or four months. In patients, you put them either in pots or in heavily shaded areas. Um, uh, it says you can plant them March through December. They're gonna do fine, you know. They might get a little bit of cold damage and slow down in the winter, but they are a great staple um, plant to have. But Make sure you put them with other plants that do require some water. And the things about impatience through those summer months, they are one of the divas. So like they're one of the diva plants. And when it's hot in July, these plants are going to whine at you and look pathetic and tell you that they're dying and you better water them. So what you need to do is tell these impatients, listen diva, talk to the hand and talk to me in the morning. If you are still wilted in the morning, I'll be glad to give you some extra water. I killed impatients by listening to them and, and watering them too much. It's just a warning there. Um, more spring and summer annuals. This wishbone plant here, they make great annuals, zinnias. When I talk about annuals, I want you to do annuals for the fun of it in um, limited areas. You don't wanna rely on annuals to be your entire you know, yard because they're very short-lived and you know, it's, it's a fairly high-ish carbon footprint if that is all you are using in your yard. We want you to lean more on those perennials, the more that, and it's cheaper for you as well. But 
fun, colorful annuals, you know, are a good thing to have to brighten up certain areas of your yard. But let's talk about those perennials, those ones that are going to be more economically um, feasible as well as, you know, the carbon footprint, because they're just going to keep coming back. Salvias, we have native varieties of this scarlet salvia is a native variety. Butterflies and hummingbirds will go crazy over them. Coreopsis, this is our Florida state flower, this tick seed, different varieties of them. They might look different on their petals and things. Um, they're, they're a great flower. They come and go, they'll bloom and go away a bit, bloom and go away a bit. They just keep going. Daylilies, I've known people with success um, with daylilies. Um, the funny thing about daylilies is they're such a common flower up north, especially this tiger lily type color. They're the roadside flowers up north. So I have, you know, we get excited about, you know, it's one of the few bulb plants you can grow well in Florida. And um, I've had my northern relatives like stick up their nose like those are the roadside plants. <laughs> Doesn't make them bad, you know, they're, they're a great plant to have. Um, more perennials, blanket flower, plant that, it'll reseed all over the place and attract all kinds of pollinators all of the time. If you have a more moist area, like the inland areas such as Brooksville, Jade City, you know, they have so much African iris, they're throwing it on each other's porches like people do zucchini, you know, up north. A little bit harder to grow in the sandier locations, but it can be done. Little work that needs done makes a great border plant. Um, my sister was telling me hers was kind of um, bit by the cold, which surprised me. But I did tell her uh, just to wait till mid-March to thin them out. They should do fine. This beach sunflower is a native that's a favorite of mine. It will freeze. It'll freeze every year. You'll be kind of glad it froze because you get tired of cutting it off your sidewalk. It's a great spreader, but it'll then come back um, every year. Interesting what I watch it do is it's, I had it in my front bed and over the year, it is years, it is somewhat declined there. And it's because through all the years of mulch and various, you know, things going on in there, the soil got too rich for this beach sunflower. It wants the worst locations that you can have, hence its name, beach sunflower to grow happily. So I just moved it out in hot sandy areas and it was much happier. Pentas, you can find them in any store. Um, not, they're not native, but they are fantastic pollinator uh, flowers to have. This sunshine mimosa is a native ground cover. It's some people love it. This is the lawn of somebody that Bill and I both know. She uses it as her lawn. Others hate it. It depends on <laughs> the situation. Um, it can be aggressive. So put it where you're going to let it spread. That is the main thing to say. People have had situations where they felt it was too aggressive. I've tried to plant it and can't hardly get it moving. So I guess it depends on, you know, each situation. Purple cone flowers, one of my absolute favorites. Nice native add to your wildflower garden through the spring and summer. Another favorite shrub of mine that is a native, oak leaf hydrangea. Looks beautiful with or without the big white cone flowers. This is our only native um, hydrangea. I thought it was just native to Florida, but I've, I've seen it growing up in Virginia. So obviously its native range spreads pretty far. This to me just says spring. You know, I've lived in Florida most of my life. So these azaleas, that's when I know that it's spring. And um, they love to be under these big old oak trees. They do like a little bit uh, more of a shady area with a lower pH. So, you know, it, that you might 
find you struggle to have them up in where I live in the Royal Highlands, which is very sandy and open, but those in a more oak hammock can do great. And now they have so many different, these are the old Karoom azaleas, the traditional azaleas that we're used to seeing. So many different azaleas that are dwarf varieties or that bloom whenever they feel like it, <laughs> you know, fall bloomers or year round bloomers. So, but these old ones just stay spring to me. Just got a question about this Walters viburnum. Somebody asked me, a friend of mine asked me, um, as she's driving down the road, do I see Chickasaw plums or am I seeing Walters viburnum? Well, I don't know what you're seeing as you're driving down the road, but it could be either or blooming right now in the early spring. These make um, a great, if you're looking for a screening, you know, between you and your neighbors, you don't want to see. <laughs> These Walters viburnum make nice, large, thicketing type um, screening hedges. And this time of year, they have these beautiful flowers and attract amazing amounts of wildlife. This is one I think is fairly underused. I don't know how well it does. Um, I think we're at the southernmost tip of its, its blooming range, this tulip poplar. So as it's getting warmer, it might not want to be one that you consider, but if you are listening from citrus or levy or, you know, Marion, you might have better luck with these tulip poplars. Here's that Chickasaw plum that I talked about that is also um, blooming. You may think as you're driving by the woods, you're seeing dogwoods. Our dogwoods have not been happy, I'd say in the past 15 years. Yes, Bill. Did you wanna add something? No, I was gonna say, you, you, we have very, very few dogwoods here in Hernando County. If you go just a little bit north, Gainesville and areas north of that, you'll see more dogwoods up there. Right. But very few here. We Summer to, takes a big toll on dogwoods in Hernando County. We used to have nice dogwoods, but several things have happened. Dogwoods across the nation um, had an issue with an, an anthracnose disease. See, I can. Very I, good. Yeah. And I'm not even the plant pathologist. And between that and the fact that we were always on their southernmost range, and just recently they have decided part of Hernando County is 9B, not 9A. Getting a few degrees warmer, <laughs> that makes a huge difference. So we were already on the southern range. So I think their southern range has moved up away from us. But the Chickasaw plums. They're still here, they're still doing great. And you can have that white, you know, they're still in the prunus family. So that white um, blooming, lovely little uh, small tree. And they're getting easier to find at native plant nurseries. A saucer magnolia. Um, says native, I'm sure it's a native hybrid because it has a name, a little gem magnolia. If you don't have room for the humongous uh, magnolias that you have to climb a fire ladder to <laughs> look at the flowers, consider one of these little gem, you know, that will get only get 30, 35 feet tall. These are gonna be coming soon on roadsides and fields and maybe if you're lucky in your yard, blue-eyed grass tiny little cute little flowers, one of the blue-eyed flowers of spring. One of the blue flowers of spring, I'm sorry. <laughs> and as I say every year, Bill knows the name annoys me because they do not have blue eyes. <laughs> Maybe they are the color of somebody's blue eyes, but they have yellow eyes, but they're a gorgeous little, little flowers. And if you can add them to your uh, landscape, that would be wonderful. Very soon, Dr. Lester's office is gonna be getting calls, I'd say in about six weeks. What are the beautiful purple flowers on the roadsides? These are phlox, P-H-L-O-X. They, the ones you see on the roadside are not native. We have native phlox, but the native phlox don't have the ability to spread as well as their Texas cousins. 
which we have all along the roadsides, the Phlox dramundi. You can get seeds for those at um, Florida Wildflower Co-op, or if you go to floridawildflowers.org. Do not pick them up <laughs> from the roadsides or try to get their seeds, that, that's illegal. <laughs> More of the blue flowers of spring, people will consider this a weed, but this um, Leatris or Blazing Star, wonderful flower to add to your landscape. I'm going quickly because Dr. Lester has the vegetables to go through, but here's some that you might consider weeds, but are do great for our pollinators out there. This one, you're gonna, the Spanish needle, you're gonna tell me that's flat out a weed, but let me, it, it, every pollinator that exists loves this Spanish needle. And as well as the bee balm, passion vine, and our Stokes aster. If you're looking for where to find some of these, here are some resources for you. Look up the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. Go to the Florida Native Plant Society's website. As well as I mentioned, floridawildflowers.org, you can find actually some seeds for some of these plants. And here are some of my resources. And let's move on quickly to spring into fruits and veggies with Dr. Lester, and I'll let you take over. Okay. Um, can I advance the slides or? I think you can. I made you the co host. Yes. Can you? Um, No. Okay, well, you have to tell me to do it then. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Just a couple of quick tips and a little bit of information on growing uh, vegetables here in Hernando County. If you have a vegetable garden or if you're thinking about starting one, you can grow a lot of vegetables here in Central Florida. Here's some numbers from a number of years ago. I probably need to look up some newer sources, but they're going to be about the same. We Grow tons of corn here, cucumbers, squash, strawberries. Right now, Plain City strawberries. So a lot of different things can be grown here in Central Florida. Homeowners don't have all the same tools that commercial growers do. They have uh, access to different um, treatments and uh, disease controls and pest controls. So that makes it, they do have a slight advantage there. But you can still grow an awful lot here. It's very important that you do things at the right time and correctly, because if you've moved here to Florida from another state, the rules are very, very different here. Next slide. So a couple of different ways that you can have a garden and start raising your own vegetables. One thing that a lot of people like to do is build a raised bed garden and you fill it with some kind of quality potting soil. You can buy it by the bag, by the truckload, dump truckload, you know, whichever you uh, prefer. The picture on the right there, those are extra raised beds with wheels on the bottom. So somebody in a wheelchair would be able to work them. Nice thing about raised beds is a lot of times you're not gonna have to be down there necessarily on your hands and knees to pull weeds and plant them and then pick the produce also. So it's a good way to involve um, more family members to be able to garden. Next slide. Container gardening works very, very well for vegetables. That's how I grow all my herbs. So I always grow herbs in containers, different size pots. Very important that you match the size of the pot with what you're trying to grow. So a small pot, like one gallon or three gallon, you can grow some herbs, a couple of radishes, maybe a couple of green bean plants. If you want to grow a tomato plant, you need at least five gallons or larger. So the larger the vegetable plant gets, the larger the pot you're going to need to grow it in. But when you're growing anything in containers, you want to use a quality potting soil. This is going to contain ingredients like perlite, peat moss, bark. It's organic and but it's designed to drain very well so you really don't want to just buy pots and fill it with soil from your backyard garden or from the backyard that's going to be too sandy too heavy may or may not drain quite right 
and you're going to have a lot of possible pest problems in it also. So try growing in containers. Use a quality potting soil, and that works very well. You can still dig, and I have a, I guess, fairly large vegetable garden in my backyard. Good old-fashioned, dug in the ground. And garden soil here in Florida has a lot of different components to it. Physical components, chemical components, biological, uh, sand drains very well. That's why when we have a, I live in Spring Hill. So when we have a tropical storm or hurricane, we get 10 inches of rain in an afternoon. I don't flood because as soon as it stops raining, it's gone very quickly in 15 minutes. Uh, the problem is it drains very well. So my vegetable garden dries out very quickly. Uh, chemical, you're going to have different nutrients that naturally are in your yard. Other nutrients you're going to have to add in the form of fertilizer. And biological, you have all kinds of different living things in the soil out in your backyard. Everything from bacteria, fungi, nematodes, insects, and everything in between. Some are good, some are bad, some are kind of neither. One of the most important things that you need to do to grow vegetables in our native soils here in Florida is either purchase or make compost and add a lot of it frequently to your garden. That is going to help your sand to hold moisture and nutrients much better and much longer. Your plants are going to love you for it. It does supply some of the nutrients your plants need. So you're probably still going to have to fertilize, but not nearly as much. Just digging a hole in your backyard, a little round circle, and plunking a tomato plant into it that you bought at the store, that tomato plant is probably going to last maybe a week before it dies. So vegetable gardens can be very successful here. It just takes a little bit of planning, knowledge, and like I said, making or buying compost and adding it, and you can be very successful. Next slide. So like I said, soil management. Here in Florida, organic matter, we have very little of it naturally. If you moved here from the Midwest, like Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, states around there, they naturally have 14 or 15 percent organic matter in their soil. Here in Florida, you're lucky if you naturally have 1 percent organic matter here. So that's why you're going to have to um, make compost, add compost, use organic mulches that are going to break down and they're always adding more organic matter to the soil and manage that soil with compost. It's going to really help the texture and structure. It does add nutrients, not all that you're going to need, but it gets you about halfway there and is going to be really the key to successful vegetable gardening here in Central Florida. Next slide. So some of the different things that if you have a vegetable garden, you should have these growing in your garden right now. It's, let's see, this is February 3rd. It's just about too late to plant most of these right now because winter is going to run out really quick here. So broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, radishes, onions, different types of lettuce, half of them I have right now in my backyard that are all ready to pick and harvest. All these other ones, peas, like good old fashioned round green peas, like green giant peas. If you've never tried growing your own, they are a thousand percent better than the canned ones and at least a hundred percent better than the frozen ones. Snow peas, beets, carrots, celery, spinach, turnips, all of these you can grow here in the winter when the weather is cool. They like it. And most of these crops don't really mind it when it gets cold, like freezing or below freezing. Some will get a little bit of leaf damage, but they very quickly recover as soon as it warms up a little bit. And these are all things that you should be harvesting now. Don't plan on planting any of these in the spring, like maybe you did up north, because that is going to be too late to put them in. But you can still plant plenty of things coming up in about a month or so. The warm season vegetables. This is everything that you can plant when we get to late February, early March. And then once again, for most of these, you can plant them again in 
mid to late August going into September and October. So here in Florida, we have two warm seasons, one cool season, that's all winter long, and then one really, really scorching hot season, which is summer from mid-June till mid-August. And there's even a few things you can grow then, but not a whole lot. So coming up soon, the things that you should be planning on putting in the ground in, gosh, just a few weeks here, potentially, things like beans, green beans, whole beans, cantaloupes, corn. Corn is a tough one for homeowners. It gets a lot of insect pest problems, takes a lot of space, takes a lot of fertilizer. Obviously, you can grow it here. Here in Hernando County, we have you pick corn farms, so it grows just fine here. It might be a little tough for most homeowners, though. Cucumbers, eggplants, okra. Okra is one of the things that doesn't mind when it gets really hot. It grows in the middle of summer here. Southern peas is another one. That's black-eyed peas, mostly. Any kind of um, peppers, green peppers, hot peppers, sweet potatoes, pumpkin squash, tomatoes, watermelons, all of those you want to plant really soon within maybe the next month. And for some of these, you already want to have your seeds planted and your little starter plants or transplants going. I have my tomatoes and peppers already up, growing. They look good. They're in trays. So when it goes really, really cold again, I pick them all up and bring them in the garage overnight to stay warm. As soon as it warms up, I carry them all back outside again. Getting a little old this year, we've had an awful lot of um, serious cold spells where for certain things, if you don't bring them in, they will be dead the next day. But that's what you want to do with your tomatoes, your peppers, your eggplants. You want to start them by seed early, grow the little plants, and then March 1st or so, it should be fairly safe for you to put them in the garden. Next slide. So we come back to our resources here. Before I turn it back to Lily, I want to give a big plug for all of our recorded classes. If you go onto YouTube and you go to the little search box at the top and look up Hernando County Government, you'll find the Hernando County Government's YouTube channel. I have a playlist there for uh, the extension service. And we have classes with the University of Florida experts on growing strawberries, sweet potatoes, calabasa, blackberries, and a bunch of other things. So be sure to check that out to be able to watch more classes and get more specific information for the specific things you're trying to grow. Yes, and here's a list of uh, the classes you might want to look specifically for that you know we're kind of addressing today, pretty plants that beat the heat. Um, reading weeds, that one is an interesting one. It will tell you the kind of weeds you have, tell you stories about the kind of soil and other conditions that you have. So that might help you gauge what type of plants to put there. Pulling in the pollinators, spring bloomers. So you're at the nursery, everything to do when you're at the nursery. Um, weeds are wildflowers, an introduction to overlooked pollinator plants. And here, uh, Dr. Lester has installing micro irrigation and edible gardens and landscapes, as well as planning your best vegetable garden ever and all the edible crops he just mentioned. We do have classes every week. Next week, I will be talking more about mulch, um, specifically and only about mulch <laughs> at the Spring Hill Library at 2.30. And we have um, these other classes coming up. Our next Lunch and Learn will be March 3rd. And that'll be just me in talking about fragrantly, Florida friendly, all those lovely smelling plants. If you happen to be in or know someone from the community of Timber Pines, let them know that we're gonna be there for the next few months every other week, Dr. Lester and I at their new community center, just for Timber Pines residents. We have a, an, uh, live in another community and say, hey, why don't you come out and see us? Set that up with you with your people who do such things and um, contact one of us. We'll be glad to do it there too. And we have an Earth Day celebration coming up on April 22nd in Brooksville at the Hernando County Master Gardener Nursery. It's going to be half a day of a lot of fun. Um, 
kids tables, uh, pruning workshop or demonstration, propagation workshop, a uh, gentleman teaching you macro photography with all the pretty plants out there. You can buy pretty plants. There will be different representatives of the Native Plant Society, Audubon, and different um, departments here in Hernando County, recycling information, all kinds of great information, April 22nd, nine to noon. And again, we mentioned, these are the ways that you can find out about us. Please go to that YouTube channel. You'll be lost for weeks listening <laughs> to all of our classes. And that is it. Now here's our emails again, if you'd like to get a hold of us. So as I said, we will address um, questions in the chat after we turn off the recording. But thank you, Dr. Lester, for thank you for taking your lunch time to talk to us about those yummy veggies and and educating us as always. And thank you to everyone, and um, have a wonderful Florida-friendly weekend. <laughs>